in his Dax Rush V8 powered car. So I'm in my dark room guys and uh, this is the second part of the video that I made about the racing cars. Here's the negatives here. I've chosen one that I want to make a print of and put in a frame and, and the reason for that is okay the photographs weren't that great you know I'm not that used to panning cars as they're going along a racetrack but when I started looking at the photographs I thought you know what it's just a photograph I wonder what it would look like printed out framed and imagining giving it to the racing driver I don't know who the racing driver is so you ain't gonna get it anyway but you know um, all these things are here to test us so um let's make a print this is a Durst M605 in larger and it's a condenser in larger, so I'm just putting the condensers in at the moment. Badly. Wrong way round. I've put my glasses on. That's better. <laughs> so this is a condenser in larger that I'm using here, and it takes these contrast filters that I use from Ilford Multigrade, uh, for Ilford Multigrade papers. So I'm putting a 35 mil condenser in with a 50 millimetre lens, which is perfect for my 35 mil negs. That's the negative carrier there. The negative will go inside there. And on top of that, I've got some anti-Newton glass to keep it flat. Some people like them, some people don't. I've got used to them, quite like it. And inside this box is my other condensers and lenses. So this is the paper that I'm using, Ilford's multi-grade, the deluxe glossy paper. There's 50 sheets of that, it's nine and a half by 12 inches. And I've also got exactly the same paper in a smaller pack. And the reason I do that is not only to make smaller prints when I want to come in and have a bit of fun, but usually I use these for the test strips for this paper. It's the same stuff, so it should give me exactly um, the same times. So the first thing I need to do, choose a negative. I know which one I want to make put it under the uh, on the carrier, put it under the larger, get a focus on, see what size I want to make a print of, which I think is going to be just over uh, 10 by 8, about 11 by 8 to fit in that frame that I've got, and uh, do some test strips, and from there I can find out what times I need to uh, project my actual enlargement to make the final print, and then I'm going to do a little tiny bit of sepia toning, just a little tiny hint, just to make the print look a little bit more nostalgic, I suppose. And over here, I've got the wet side of my dark room. It's only a shed in my garden. It's not big at all. Um, so these are my trays that I'm going to be using. This is the stop bath. This is all fresh chemicals. Sometimes I'll reuse the chemicals if I feel like they haven't exhausted and they're still going to give me a good performance. Uh, but other times, if I'm making a print that's kind of valuable, valuable to me in any way, um, I'll just mix up new chems, fresh chems for that darkroom session and bang out a few prints of the same thing. Uh, this is the developer, Ilford's multi-grade developer, photo speed stop bath I'm using, cheap and cheerful that stuff, and also photo speeds FX odorless fixer, FX30 odorless fixer. Now I'm putting my fixer at the top tray here, it's just a space saver. Some people might say, oh my God, you're going to splash chemicals into your developer. you just got to be careful not to do so. And I don't have any troubles with that. It works perfectly for me, but it just saves me a bit of space when I'm using these larger trays. You can see I haven't got much room. So over this side now, I've got a light box, which is sunken into my desk. This is just a light panel that I bought out of a Home Depot store. Um, it's, for ceiling, it's a ceiling light, but there you go. It sits there nicely for my negatives to sit on so I can see which one which ones I want to choose for printing. That's the negative there. I've got gloves if I want to use gloves on the negatives, if I want to give them a clean or whatever, but normally they're clean. I just hold them by the sides, got no problem at all. The hardest part is with this negative carrier being anti-Newton glass on the top, he's trying to get the dust out. But I've got a rocket blower here as well, so I can just eliminate anything on there at the moment. Lovely, and I've got these little tiny masks um, that were sent to me by a uh, bit by bit photo on Instagram, a guy called Tim Soderstrom. Uh, lovely guy, he sent me these little masks that he makes on 3D printers. There's a few medium format ones there as well. And they just give me a little tiny bit of it. They leave a bit of the, um, the rebate around the negative, which gives me a little tiny black rebate. You'll see in a little while. But uh, yeah, so the, cat, the um, negative holder is just sort of um, bored out slightly just so it can show some of the rebate on the negative. Looks quite nice if you want a border. 
So what I need to do is, first of all, uh, sort my mask area out, make sure that I know what size I'm printing uh, for my paper, and then start my test strips. These are the contrast filters I'm gonna be using. Um, I always use contrast filters, and because of that, I always start off with a two and a half grade filter. It's kind of like a happy medium uh, for this sort of paper. So I always start off with a two and a half grade filter, and if I can nail it with that filter, without any jiggery pokery, no dodging, burning, anything like that, um, then I'm happy as a pig in shit. If not, I can then use these filters to control the contrast. So that's what they are for. They're just like um, like your Lightroom or Photoshop contrast sliders, you know? That's what they do. They just control the contrast on the paper. So straight away you can see, I've turned the enlarger on, the negatives in there, it's projected straight away onto the easel. I've marked out my size of the print that I need. Inside the frame I've got is 11 by eight. So I'm gonna mask out eight and a half by 11 and a half, and that should just give me a little bit of breathing space um, uh, once it's framed. So my paper's gonna go underneath that. And this is just a uh, an old print that I used just to make sure that I've got my borders okay. Because I can never work that out, to be honest with you. I'll just put a little tiny squares around the edge of my printing area. And straight away I can see that my borders are slightly off, so this needs to come over a little bit more. That looks good. And there you go, so I've got some white border that side, some that side, it's not perfect, but it's fine, it's only going in a frame. So it's quite good fun in the dark room. Usually I'm in here with uh, a bit of music, maybe a beer if it's a weekend or something, and uh, sit around and print away to my heart's content. And I enjoy this kind of work because professionally I'm always on a computer um, graphically, and it's nice because I can just do photography without sitting on a computer, without sitting on Photoshop, without playing around apart from when I'm making YouTube videos, of course. So I need to just frame this up how I want it, ready to go. I don't want to crop too much. There's going to be some sort of crop factor, but I don't want to crop in too much. I want to give the picture a little bit of breathing space. That car is coming in from the left. So that should be about right. Okay, all I need to do now is get a focus on and do a test strip. Whenever I do focus, I've got a grain focus finder here. I'm just focusing on the grain. Um, and I used the same paper, a little tiny test piece there to put on there because I don't know whether that couple of millimetres makes any difference, but it's just a good practice to do so, I reckon. So I'm just looking through the focus finder and looking for that grain. There it is. And it's quite fine grain. This is Oro 100 UN54 film. Quite fine grain. See if I can show you that on the camera here. See if I can get in there for you. <laughs> it's much easier with my eyes. I'm finding that difficult to show you. There's the grain there, can you see it? So that means I'm focused, all I need to do now is do some test strips. Now I've got a test strip machine that I can use. I've got this little test strip machine that I can use here, you can see. So all I need to do is place that on a certain part of the image and then do some tests. So I'm gonna place that just underneath the car area here. So I've got a bit of ground, a bit of car, and I can go um, one second, two second, three second, four second, five second, six seconds. There's various ways you can do tests. This is the way I'm choosing to do it. And this is the timer that I'm using. Uh, it's got a standby. I can turn the lamp on for focusing on what I was just doing. I can turn it off. Obviously, I need it off now. Um, and this is the time. So if I want to choose five seconds, I'll go five seconds, press the button. It will turn the light on for five seconds and then go off again. But I only need one second. So I'll put it right down to there. It's pretty accurate. And in case you're wondering about my safe lights, I use these safe lights. These are just um, video panels that I use. They're RGB, so I've got it set to red. I need to have the brightness at 30% to protect my paper. If it's at 100%, my paper gets fogged. 
so 30% is fine. And I've also got a standard beehive light there. I've got another safe light there. I've got another one up there, which isn't turned on. In fact, I think it's broken. Okay, that one's not working. Uh, I've got another RGB light there. I can turn red, which I need to do now. So I'm gonna get some paper out. There she goes, that's at 30%. So all these lights are safe. So the lens on my larger is a 50 mil lens. It's 2.8 to f16 or 22. Um, can't remember now, but I don't go that small usually. Is it set to 2.8? I'm just going to bring it down two stops to 5.6, and that's my rock to stand on. So now I'll just get a piece of test paper out. Like I said, that five by seven paper that I use uh, for my test, it just saves my bigger paper. And I'll just cut that down the middle. So I can do two tests with this now. One piece of paper. Put this piece back in the box. There it goes. And now I can start my test strip. So increments of one second. So I'll have one, two, three, four, five, six seconds when I've finished. One, two, three, four, five, done. And in it goes into my developer. And I'll let that go way past a minute and uh, see how it starts to come out. One second increments might not have been enough, but we'll soon see. And this is all the testing stage, so nothing has to be perfect at this part until you've gone a little bit further down the line and you've got the right time for your print. So I just let the developer drip off, put it into the stop bath. It's only a test strip and I can see straight away that I didn't give it enough time. So this is going to be more than a six second um, print. I'm reckoning maybe 10 seconds. That's a stop bath. Now we'll put it up into my fixer. And that's now going to stabilise the image and make it light tight. I could turn the lights on pretty much now, but I don't bother. i just leave the red lights on until this has been in there for a minute or so. Get it washed and have a look. So that's the test strip there. You can see one second was nowhere near enough. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So I reckon another four seconds on top of that. But I've also got a little tiny hair there, so I need to make sure that I get rid of that when I make my print. Let's do another test strip and see how we get on. I'm going to do away with the test strip machine, and I'm going to take a hunch at 10 seconds, put another test strip over it for 10 seconds, and see where I'm going from there. Let's pull that light over a bit, I can see more. There you go. So let's go right across the car, up into the sky, down onto the grass. 10 seconds. I could shorten that time by opening up the aperture, another stop or two, but I don't, I'm in no rush, I don't need to. I think 5.6 is a good sweet spot on that lens. So in it goes again. I'm not interested in any sharpness at this point. I'm just literally looking um, for the black and whites, just looking at the contrast and the tonality of the uh, test strip and seeing if 10 seconds now is it, seeing what it's doing with the highlights, seeing what that grade two and a half filter is doing with the highlights and the shadows for me. It might be a case that I might have to change the filters to lower the contrast or even increase the contrast. I don't know. I think it's gonna be all right with two and a half grade though. This one's coming out okay. And that's what I just did at 10 seconds. Still got that little hair there, so that's definitely on the negative. I need to fix that. Um, I can see the driver, the highlights are okay. The shadows are okay. I could do it a little bit more, I think, than 10 seconds. So I'm gonna do another test strip at 12 seconds um, using another piece of paper and just seeing how we're looking with 12 seconds. I just wanna see if I can pull those highlights in a bit more and make these shadows a bit darker. Um, still on that two and a half grade filter. Uh, there you go, that's 12 seconds. I'm quite happy with that. I don't, I don't need to start fussing with filters and trying to get highlights in. And stuff. That, to me, is okay. I'm happy with that. I've got the details, I've got shadows of black and whites. It's not gray. I've got highlights there. 
and uh, I've got all the tones that I need. The only thing is, is I've just realised this is the wrong negative. That one was too blurry. I've got a better one of that car. <laughs> but I'm still going to go ahead with the print. Let's do it and get that hair off at the same time. Right, okay, first thing I need to do, second thing I need to do, is uh, refocus again, just make sure that my enlarger hasn't slipped, because mine has a tendency to slip, and it has slightly. I need to get that grain back. There it is there. We know the time. And from my test strips, this should be the final print. I, I'm thinking I could go ahead and just vignette a little tiny bit around the edges, which is what I might do um, without even looking. But I think I might just vignette the edges slightly. Off it goes. 12 seconds. And into the developer. When you put your paper in a developer, I don't know if this matters or not, but I always scoop it in. And as soon as I pull the um, tray down, the developer rolls right across the paper. Um, just so that it all gets equal amount of time, I suppose. But I haven't really seen any problems when I haven't done it that way. The print's a little bit wonky, actually. I need to realign that. That's interesting. The only thing with these photographs there was a slight, there was a small bag the other side and you saw how busy the place was. I couldn't get from left to right. It was the only little gap that I had in between crowds uh, when I was taking these shots. And there was this small bag and it was really annoying me, but I thought there's nothing I can do. I can't just jump over the fence and remove it. So I just thought it is what it is. It's just gonna have to be, you know? This is looking quite nice. No vignette in at all, actually. Let's get this one stopped, fixed, and we'll have a look. The hair's gone anyway. So it's coming out the developer now, just trying to rinse off as much as I can. And into the stop bath. And all the stop bath is doing is literally stopping the development, but it's pretty much stopped anyway. It was in there for nearly a couple of minutes, just to make sure that everything was getting developed that needed to be developed. Um, but the stop bath is handy to get all that developer off before it goes in the fix. It's also handy sometimes if you need to pull the print out of the developer quicker um, for a lower contrast if you want, or to stop it going over dark. Sometimes that can happen if you can't be bothered to recorrect it on the enlarger, um, and it will just halt the development. And now into the fixer and this is the part where I've got to be careful because don't forget my fixer trays up here so just make sure I get all the stop bath off as much as possible and into the fixer wash me tongs so I'll leave that in there for a minute or so get that completely fixed and then we'll uh, wash the print and have a look so I don't have any running water in my um, shed dark room in the garden. The water comes from a hose pipe outside and it's all drained off afterwards into a, a drum just next to the shed. So I have to wash my prints. This is clean water in, a, in the sink here. So this is how I have to wash my prints. And I've never had any problems at all doing this. I've never had any stains um, afterwards. So it's getting all the chemicals off. And there's also a little tiny bit of rinse aid in there as well. Only a few drops just to help it a bit more. So I'm literally just washing all the chemicals off. So I'll let it just soak in there for a few minutes and it'll be ready to hang up and dry. But it looks nice other than that paper bag. I quite like the paper bag there. It just gives it a little bit of, uh, a little bit of flow. It just makes you wonder what the hell is that on the floor? It's something there, don't worry. There's that little bloody hair. It was there and then I blew it over to this side. But it doesn't matter because this isn't the negative that I wanted to make a print of. I've got them mixed up. That one's too blurry. The other one is uh, sitting on the side. So at least I know it's going to be 12 seconds, the same one. That was all shot in the same light. So I'm pretty much sure it's going to be 12 seconds again. Let's do it. So that's the one. That's the negative that I wanted. That's better. Number 69. I've got to say sorry to number 66 car. It's okay. It's nice. I like it. Number one, it's just this. It's really starting to bug me. 
to get rid of that in Photoshop is a total doddle. But um, I'm thinking maybe I can burn it out. So I've done a couple of test strips. You can see there, I've tried to burn it out. Still under the two and a half gray filter. It doesn't look great. I'm getting sort of this darker, smudgy area that I don't like. And then I used a zero filter just on that area after the 12 seconds and uh, it's still there. You can still see it. So I'm a little bit, what can I do? I'm thinking maybe I can just push the negative over slightly or the paper and kind of clone this area into here, if you're with me. So just shift the um, paper over slightly, cover everything apart from this, so I can clone this area over that. Let's see if it work. So if anyone else has got a better way, or can let me know in the comments how to successfully remove that or clone it, this is the only way I know how. And in fact, you know what guys, I've never done this before. I've never had to, um, but I'm gonna give it a go. And it's just common sense. I haven't read this or, or read up on it. It's just common sense thinking maybe that's what I can do. I think I've got the opportunity to do it. So um, two and a half grade filter. Let's make that print first. I've got to be careful with this. Um, and then I need to shift the easel over. Okay, that's done. So that's where my mark is. If I shift the easel over this side, I need to somehow then cover the whole print which I can use with this um, hole, but not for 12 seconds. 12 seconds ago, too dark. It's still gonna be there, I think. So I'm just roaming around the area, cloning away. Let's see what happens there. <laughs> so, uh, well, I tried it. <laughs> I tried to clone into it. Mate, that is hard work. I, you know, I just thought to myself, I'd come out with this and I thought, I'm not even going to bother. I just keep wasting paper trying to clone it out. Um, but I tried to clone it. And here's the one that just coming out of the fixer now. My finished print with the paper bag in. That's uh, in the fresh water there. So I've still got the paper bag there and I've done a little tiny bit more burning on the car in this area and a little bit of vignette around the bottom just to make it pop. Let's get it dry, hang it out, we'll have a look. So there it is there. I'll have to uh, just suffer the bag. The only thing is I've got a little tiny mark there that I'm not happy with. So I've just cleaned the negative. That's come off. That was on the uh, emulsion side of the film. Just um, very carefully got that off. I'm happy with the whole look. You can see here it's a light colored car with the sun coming down on it. So the bonnet and the roof is nowhere near the same inertia as the background of the paper. So I know that I've got my highlights on that car. If that was the same as the background, I'd need to work a bit more, maybe on a contrast zero low filter just to bring that up or a bit of split grading, but I don't need to muck about with it. So the only thing I'm gonna do now is make a couple more prints, uh, master prints like this, and I'm gonna try and, and uh, sepia tone one very, very slightly just to make it a little bit warmer. Let's see what happens. So I've got some photo speed uh, sepia toner. This is the bleach and that's the toner. There goes the bleach there. Notice I'm wearing a glove, this stuff isn't the nicest stuff to get on your hands. The dilutions are quite minimal just so I can get a slight sepia tone, even if it's a, just, just a hint, you might not even see it. But uh, here's a print first, that's got to be wet. So the print's wet, I need to put it into the bleach and that's gonna just strip the highlights very slightly and then in the sepia toner, it will bring a little bit of sepia back into the highlights. Let's have a go. Not too long in here. One, two, I don't want to strip the highlights completely. Three, four seconds will do. Let's bring that out and we'll put that into the wash. Get that all off. This is all clean, fresh water. And then we'll just put this into the sepia toner and it should bring them back. would bring the highlights back with a slight touch of sepia. We'll soon see a difference. It's only very, very slight because I've highly diluted the sepia so it doesn't go, I don't want it to look like an 1800s picture, you know. So the dormy shed's still open. These are the two prints. That one there is the one I've just slightly toned with sepia. You can see it. I don't know if Aaron's picking it up on the camera, but uh, so I've got a tidy bit darker room up there. I'll get all my negatives back in the sleeves and uh, then I'm going to wait for these to dry and get this one, the sepia one, in a frame. See how it looks. So my point being is, you know, these photographs, they look all right on Instagram, someone's website or whatever, but I think the real proof in the pudding is when you make a print and you put it in a frame and you present it to someone and go, 
there you go mate i think it makes more of an impression you know and whether it's a good photograph great photograph unless it's a portrait and they go oh my god i look awful if it's their car they'll love it